Welcome to the Diary of an Apartment Investor podcast. I'm your host, Brian Briscoe, and it's middle of October. What does that mean? That means taxes are due. They were due three days ago, and I know what you're saying. Wait, aren't taxes due in April? Well, I mean, I guess yes, but you technically you can submit an extension. It's free and it's automatically approved, but you said submit an extension and you get six months added to your filing period. So technically taxes are due October 15th. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about taxes because I just very recently wrapped up my tax return. All right. Nothing like waiting to the last minute, right? But just recently wrapped up my own tax return. And once again, the news was very, very good. I was a little bit worried. Maybe I shouldn't have been, but I want to talk about some of the benefits to the taxation system for real estate investors. Now, part of the reason that I extended, this is one of the downsides. So if you're a potential syndicator, want to be syndicator, or you are a syndicator, one of the reasons I had to extend is when you passively invest in apartments, the form that you get for that investment is a K-1. I did not get the last K-1 from an apartment investment until July. So I could not file my income taxes in April. If you are on the syndication team, do everything you can to get those K-1s out before probably the end of March at least, but I would say even earlier than that if possible. Now, a lot of times there are delays, you know, especially if you close on a property late. I ended up getting two K-1s after April 15th. One of them was a property that I was a GP on. We closed on December 27th. And we couldn't schedule our cost segregation study or analysis until the end of February. And then we got all the information to our accountant and we didn't get our K-1s on that property out until after April 15th. There are some times where it's difficult, but you know, the last one I got for the year was in July. End of the day, moral of the story, as syndicators, people who are running these investments, do everything you can to front load the work so that you can get the taxes done. You know, we're, we're closing on a property, hopefully before the end of the month, and we're going to get that cost segregation study. We, we've got it scheduled right now. We're hoping we're closing, but we got the cost segregation study scheduled for middle of November. And hopefully they'll have that cost segregation report to us within a couple of weeks that we can turn around and get it to our accountant to get the K-1s out to everybody involved in the investment. But what I really wanted to talk about I did go on a little tangent. What I really wanted to talk about is tax treatment. And there are some ways where the tax treatment for people who are doing and not just investing, it's super duper beneficial. So just a quick review of some of the laws with passive losses. So for example, most people who are listening to this podcast probably have W-2 income. You know, they're getting paid by an employer. It's active income. And the IRS divides income up into three different categories. And those three categories are active income, portfolio income, and passive income. When you do your cost segregation study, you put all that depreciation in, you are receiving passive losses. And the IRS rules are if you're making less than $100,000, you can take up to $25,000 in passive losses and deduct that from your active income. So for people who are making less than $100,000, the passive losses you get from investing passively and getting on that K-1 can save you a lot of money in taxes. You know, if you're in the 25% tax bracket, you know, $25,000 is going to save you $6,000 a year in taxes. Now, the IRS starts phasing that out between 100 and 150,000. At 100,000, you get that $25,000 passive loss benefit. At 150,000, you get zero. And it's, you know, every $2 of income, you lose a dollar from that benefit, is how it works. The nice part is if you are what the, real, what the IRS considers a real estate professional, there is no limit to how much income your passive losses can basically offset. Last year was the first year that I qualified as a real estate professional. And I'll tell you, on my tax return, I got every penny back that I paid into on my W-2. Most of you guys know I retired from the Marine Corps a year ago and I spent most of the year receiving W-2 income. 
And the income that wasn't W-2 income, I also had 1099 income from my retirement pay. I had some capital gains income, but I had a ton of depreciation. Now, incidentally, I made about as much in 2021 from my real estate pursuits than what I made from, you know, a 10 months worth of active duty pay plus two months worth of retirement pay. Just to put things in perspective, taxable income or what should have been taxable, potential taxable income was a lot of money last year, more than, than I've ever made before, but I paid zero in taxes. Why? Because I do qualify as a real estate professional and I have so much depreciation that my adjusted gross income on my tax form was zero. Now, there is a little caveat to that. I did end up paying payroll taxes. And my W-2 income statement, you know, I had federal income tax withheld. I got 100% of that federal income tax withheld back to me. The payroll taxes, the FICA, okay, that just goes away. But what I did have to pay at the end of the year is the FICA payroll taxes on the real estate money that I earned before depreciation is accounted for. So what my tax bill ended up looking like when I turned in my 1040 this year is my adjusted gross income was zero. I ended up having to pay a whopping $600 in additional payroll taxes that were not offset by other tax credits and whatnot. End of the day, I got a large tax return, zero income tax, and in addition to what was withheld from my paychecks over the years, over the, the entire year in payroll taxes, I paid an extra $630 to the tax person. Now, here's a question. What do you have to do to qualify as a real estate professional? Well, according to the IRS, you need 750 hours of work towards the real estate profession. There's some very specific definitions on what counts and what doesn't. So make sure if you're if you think you're a real estate professional and it's your first time, make sure you discuss it with an accountant. Okay. So make sure that you actually qualify. And you know, if you can log those hours even better. If you're audited, you may have to show proof of the 750 hours. But the other caveat is spend 750 hours and you have to spend more hours in real estate than you do in anything else, okay? So if you are a W-2 employee, it's extremely difficult to meet both of those, over 750 hours and more than you do from any other income source. So if you're a full-time W-2 employee, 40 hours a week, you probably spent 2,000 hours last year on your W-2. So that would mean you'd have to have 2,001 hours working on real estate to become a real estate professional, possible, but not likely. If you qualify as a real estate professional, you get a lot more tax advantages. One other tip, if you are married filing jointly on your tax return and you have a W-2 or your spouse has a W-2, basically one of the two of you has to qualify for a, as a real estate professional to offset your entire active income with depreciation, okay? Or to, to lift the limits, the $25,000 limit. To lift that limit, only one of the two people who are married filing jointly has to qualify for a real estate professional. So if you have a W-2 or your spouse, if, if one of the spouses has a W-2 and the other doesn't, it's a lot easier to make the second spouse without the W-2 a real estate professional. Just once again, talk with an accountant about this on what qualifies as real estate work, but and then document it. But if you can log 750 hours of qualified real estate work, one of the two of you can qualify as a real estate professional. You check the box on your taxes, and then your active income can be completely offset with your passive losses. How do you get passive losses? Well, you invest passively in real estate deals into deals that there's going to be a lot of depreciation, you know, accelerated depreciation, bonus depreciation, you know, so make sure the, the sponsor is going to do a cost segregation study and do the accelerated and bonus depreciation. Okay. Uh, incidentally for this year, hundred percent bonus depreciation is still on the table next year, you know, starting January 1st, 
that bonus depreciation goes to 80%. The benefit for this year is going to be slightly better than the benefit for next year. And then the following year, 2024, the benefit's going to be down to 60%. And it goes down by 20% every year until that bonus depreciation is zero. Hopefully, Congress will extend that. You know, I think we're going to have to have a Republican in the White House and a Republican Congress for that to happen. But, you know, we'll see. Now, let's go back to the case if you're not a qualified real estate professional. In that case, you have some limitations on you know, what that those passive losses from the depreciation can do for you. Even if it can't offset your active income, if you have, you know, let, let's say you invested $100,000 in, in real estate deals and you end up with $60,000 in passive losses, at a minimum, those passive losses can be counted against any other passive income gains that you have. You know, let, let's say you have $10,000 in passive income and a $60,000 loss from your $100,000 investment. You don't pay taxes on that $10,000 passive gain that you had from a different source because your passive losses are going to offset that. If you had $60,000 in passive losses, $10,000 in passive gains, the net total is negative 50,000. So you have $50,000 in passive losses. So it will offset all of your other passive income. Now, what happens if you can't use all of your passive losses in a given tax year? Well, the good news is you can carry that forward to future tax returns. So when you or your accountant files your tax returns, there's a form that's going to talk about your passive losses. And at the very bottom, it's going to say the amount carried forward to the next year. Okay. And next year, when you fill out your tax form, it's going to start with the amount carried forward from last year. So even if you can't use all of your passive losses this year, those passive losses are going to be carried forward to years where you can use those. For example, I started, I made my first passive investment in multifamily in 2019. I was not a real estate professional. I could not use all of those passive losses in 2019. Okay. 2020. I did not qualify as a real estate professional. I had more passive losses. I could not use those passive losses in 2020, and they got carried forward to 2021. Now, the nice thing is 2021, when I made roughly $300,000, I had enough passive losses carried forward from 2019 and 2020 to completely offset my active income from the year, 100% of my active income. And now... I have a six-figure amount carried forward in passive losses till next year, okay? And it just snowballs. It could potentially snowball. And first $100,000 that I earn in 2022 is going to be 100% tax-free. So anyway, taxes. I think it's really important to understand that as a real estate professional, and if you are into multifamily syndication, and when you finally go full-time, in syndication, those passive investments that you've made, you know, up until now, all of that passive income losses that you get on your K-1s get carried forward and you could potentially pay a lot less in taxes once you get out of your day job and move into real estate syndication full time. As a syndicator, there are some extreme benefits. If you qualify as a real estate professional because you're a real estate agent or a broker or you know some other category, well, hey, congratulations. Any passive investment you make in real estate that creates those passive losses is also going to offset your active income. End of the day, the IRS you know, has a lot of provisions that help us as real estate professionals. It's just a matter of taking advantage of it. I would also suggest that uh, when you get to the point where your taxes become complicated like that, you go find yourself an accountant, all right? And have that accountant help take care of everything for you. That said, thanks for listening today. And hopefully next year you pay close to zero in taxes yourself. Hey, if you like that episode, make sure you hit that subscribe button. But more importantly, if you haven't joined our multifamily educational community, the Tribe of Titans yet, you are missing out. So get yourself 30 days free by clicking the link below in the description or go to thetribeoftitans.info, and we'll see you there.